This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla because sometimes existing is exhausting. My name's Anthony Padilla, and today I'll be spending a day with home invasion survivors to uncover what living through such a terrifying and violating event is really like. By the end of this video, we'll find out how a split second reaction prevented a shotgun from being fired directly into someone's face, what the healing process is like for a 12 year old who was shot in the head only to witness the brutal murder of his family before his house was burned down with him inside it, and how having a home intruded by a hostile, crazed family and with a gun and a death wish affects every moment of life moving forward. Have these survivors been able to move past these agonizing events in order to successfully reclaim their lives? Or has this trauma propelled them into a life of incessant paranoia and fear, even within the confines of their own? Hello, RJ. Hey, Anthony, how you doing? Gavin. Hello. Cash. Hi, Anthony. How are you? Can you give us uh, a brief synopsis of what happened? Back in February of 2019, we had just gotten home from a date. I was in the kitchen. It was around 1 a.m. And boom, my door swings open. Guy barges in with a loaded shotgun and a plastic bag and starts making demands. It was the beginning of 2018. There was a home invasion by someone who knew of me and my online presence. He just decided that I should die that particular day and broke into my house and tr tried it. I was 12 years old. It was April 14th, 2002. It was about 5.30 in the morning. A friend of my family's came into my house and ended up murdering my family and attacking me and setting my house on fire, so. Before the invasion, did you have any sense that something was off? I had a genuine sort of overall fear that it might happen. And I, I'd had that fear for years. I had no sense that anything was imminent. No, not at all. Beforehand, there wasn't any kind of indicator that anything was amiss or that we were gonna have any kind of altercation that night. Before the invasion actually happened, two days prior to that, my dad had warned me that my mom and himself were robbed at gunpoint for selling drugs and cash. The guy who robbed them was a family friend. And my dad told me two days before, he's like, something's fishy, something's going on. My family was on high alert at that moment. Are you comfortable explaining what led up to the home invasion and what actually occurred? As I'm in the kitchen, boom, my door swings open. A gentleman wearing a mask and gloves. Oh, a gentleman, not an intruder, <laughs> a gentleman. <laughs> He's bracing a 12 gauge and he swings it around from my fiance back towards me and immediately he starts yelling commands. Get down, boys. Right now. I take about maybe a millisecond, two milliseconds to size him up and I decide I'm going for it. I grabbed the barrel of the shotgun and threw it up as far as I could towards the ceiling and as back as I could away from everybody. As soon as I did that, he was completely taken off guard. There was about a half a second there where he could have gone ahead and just wasted me. If he would have pulled the trigger, it was guts all over the wall for me. I kind of kicked him in his knee and swept his leg out from under him and both of us went to the ground. And I just have both my arms bear hugging the shotgun Shotgun. He picks me up with the shotgun and starts making a break for the door. Well, as soon as he gets to the stairs, they're all icy and wet and he slipped. And as soon as he did, I had the shotgun. I did hit him in the head two times with the shotgun, forced him outside the door physically and slammed it shut. Within maybe 30 seconds, he's back at the door. I go ahead and open the door and ask him what he wants. And he says he wants his shotgun back and he'll go away. I had his weapon, so I knew he wasn't going to do anything. He starts telling us if we just give him the shotgun back, that he'll go away and never come back again. I tell him I'm not giving him the shotgun back. He says he's yeah. calling the police. I tell him, no, I'm calling wait, wait, the this, police. This guy that invaded you threatened you with police? Yeah. And I say, I'm calling the police, <laughs> motherfucker. And I'm standing at the top of the stairs with the, with the gun in my hands. The police actually arrived. Um, and he had already left my front door at this point. And then the cops bust in the door again in full SWAT gear with guns pointed at us. And we both try to explain to them in a very uh, anxiety ridden way yeah. what's just occurred. And then they told me right after that, well, we actually have that guy. We just found him right around the block sitting in his vehicle and don't worry about it, he's going to jail. 
So he decided that 3 a.m. he was just going to break in. He tried to get in for a while quietly. In the end, gave up on that and actually just shot the back door window. So we both woke up, minor discussion about what the noise was. It was enough for me to be like, we cannot investigate this. We have to check the security system first. Just saw someone walking through the house with a, with a gun. I immediately called 911. We just decided it, was, it wasn't safe to try and get out. We thought we could potentially just buy some time just by being quiet. So we moved into the closet. Lots of clothes in there. So I thought, you know, that's the most soundproof place. Sat sort of focused on the entrance. I was trying to hope that I had the advantage in that I was ready for when he would come in and he yeah. potentially wouldn't know whether I was going to be in there. So I think in the moment, my, my plan was to kind of blindside him somehow, maybe like get the jump on him as he came in and hopefully wrestle the gun off him or just try and beat him to death with something that was in there. But I just felt like this is it and I'm going to have to try and fight. And that was, that was just a really rough feeling of like helplessness and constant adrenaline in my heart beating so fast. I could like feel it in my ears. I've never felt anything like it. It didn't feel right to be a robbery. I was 100% convinced that it was definitely a targeted attack. The guy that I think had given up, I think he thought his time was up, decided to leave. And it was as he was leaving that the police arrived. And it turns out that the guy had almost immediately himself in the head. The trajectory of the bullet went actually towards the police who then opened fire back. From that point on, it was a, a load of gunshots. Just sound like a full on gunfight. We learned some stuff from the notes left on his phone. Someone with a mental illness just decided, based on the voices in his head, he needed to come and take care of this situation. The main goal was that he wanted me to die alone without children. Bought a gun, came all the way from New Mexico, just spent the entire day trying to, trying to kill me. Damn. He couldn't find me for most of that day. He was just like trying to hunt me down. I was completely oblivious, just like fluking my way through this day. I think I was having meetings, you know, elsewhere. I wasn't where he thought I was going to be and eventually just waited for me to be asleep in my house. April 14th, 2002, I was sleeping on the living room couch. I wake up to a knock on the door. My dad, he opened the door to a family friend. His name was Marky. Apparently, two nights before that, he robbed my family. I kind of wake up a little bit. I'm like, he's here, so he must be bringing back the money or the drugs or whatever he took. My dad starts walking into the kitchen, and I just keep hearing Marky say, but where's Joanna at? Where's Crystal at? Where's LJ at? Once my dad finally like got him into the kitchen, thinking that you know he's going to probably give him the money back or the drugs, then at some point, I just see Marky like, lift up out of his you know shirt a gun i heard two gunshots and then i heard my dad hit the ground that moment i kind of sat up on the couch marky's walking straight towards me he points the gun right into my head and i able to turn my hand in front of my head in time and he shoots and it goes through my hand i have like a bullet hole and stuff through my hand went through my ear into the back of my head and then i have a scar back here and i just instantly collapse onto the couch and I just lay there. I could just smell gunpowder. It was a giant flash of bright light right in my face. The biggest ringing sound ever. As I'm laying there, I see him walk into my mom's bedroom and I hear a gunshot in there. And then as I'm still laying there, he comes out into the living room again, at the back of the bedroom where my sister comes out of. He shot her, so, and then she hit the ground and I, I got up and I'm still dazed. And at this point, he must have grabbed a knife. And then he comes up behind me, grabs me. And I could feel like the, the jaggedness of the blade like go across my neck. And it just, mm -hmm. just felt like warmness go down. It was, started bleeding at that moment. And then like, I have these scars on my neck where I just went. He cut me with my lip, stabbed me in my arm. I have a stab wound here and he stabbed me in my back as well. And at that point, I just kind of felt like I was done for. So I just collapsed on the ground and just stayed there. I could hear my sister calling out my name, just asking me if I was okay. And I wasn't trying to say anything because I didn't want to get acknowledged. You know, I didn't want anything to happen to us. He must've saw that I was moving, kicked me a couple of times in the head. Eventually he put a blanket over top of me. I kind of passed out at that moment and I kind of wake up to crackling and there's smoke all through the house and like half of my house is already on fire. I got to get out of here. There's no time, like the flames by the door. And eventually I was able to get the door unlocked, I was able to stumble out and I fell off the porch, crawled my way to my driveway. And at that point, I just laid there. It was freezing cold, but I'm drenched in blood. And But I can feel the heat 
of the fire calling for help. You know, my voice is raspy and then eventually I kind of remember my neighbor. They saw my house on fire, so they came running down and I remember the ambulance coming, putting me in. Everyone just kept asking me who did it and I told them. I remember the helicopter ride to the hospital and I remember waking up two days later in the hospital after two surgeries. Damn, what were you thinking? What was going on through your mind knowing that your family members were harmed and probably dead and there was a fire, your your home, everything that you had ever known was being destroyed right then. As a 12 year old boy, I was like, this can't be happening. I cannot believe that everything is being taken away at this moment. And you know, these are my final few seconds that I have. I thought it was over at that moment. Did you know that your family was killed in those in the, that moment? The moment it happened, I knew there was no chance. And as I was getting out of the house, I knew there was no chance of getting back in to get them out. Something woke me up at that exact moment to get me out of that house. It's grateful that it, you know, happened. Did you know this invader? No, I didn't know him personally. A friend of this intruder had some kind of beef with my roommate's friend. I'd never had any interaction with this person. I even went back and looked through tweets. I was like, did I ever have like a online altercation with this person? And I couldn't find any trace that I'd ever said a single thing to this person. When did you eventually find out the intruder's motives? Days, maybe even like a week later after the police had done more investigation, like got into his devices, searched his home. He wrote so much stuff down about doing this. I try not to like look too far into it because the guy clearly just needed so much help. I feel like a lot of people have dealt with someone hating them online or even someone in their life. They're like, why does this person not like me? This makes no sense. But for this to be someone that has never met you, that has beyond pure hate for you, how is that for you to process and acknowledge that this is like a thing that exists out there unbeknownst to you? It was one of the most disturbing parts about it because it, it, it could just happen to anyone at any point. How did your life change immediately following that? After it happened, I really had, I just really debated like, is it worth continuing to have this, you know, on camera personality? I would happily go back in time, never have been on camera just to have not gone through that. Everything just feels numb in comparison to how it did. I just do have bad days where I'm just, you know, still freaking out over the possibility and yeah. all of the unknowns in life. And I think I just had to come to terms with the fact that, you know, you can try and take more control over stuff in your life. This was just a big reminder of the fact that you're not really, you're not really in control of anything at any point. Like I knew I lost my family. I knew that they were gone. I was sent to foster care. I was in witness protection at that time. I wasn't even allowed to talk about it. I had to say I was in a car accident. I had to, you know, no one knew who I was and I had all these you know, friends who I'm telling, you know, my name's RJ, but well, my real name's LJ. And so it was just surreal because I was starting a whole new life with a fake name. I literally started living that second life right away. And I just had to keep moving forward and couldn't let it show. I had to just keep being a different person than I was. Would you say that it helped you or cause you like, you know, more harm by repressing those emotions? I think in a way, it did help me. I feel like if I would have stayed where I was, yes, I would have been in good care with my family, but I don't think I would have been able to cope living that life right away. I feel like every conversation would have been about what actually happened or anything like that. So I think it was actually probably good for me to get up, outrooted, uprooted and live a different life. They tried to remove the bullet from your head. Two different surgeries? Two different surgeries. They tried back to back. Couldn't get it out and they said, scar tissue should build around it, but eventually it moved. So now, it migrated a few years later and now it's in my lower back. I'm supposed to get surgery to get it removed. So you have a scar on your head because they try to take it out of your head and now you're gonna have a scar on your lower back for the same bullet. Yep. How has your life changed most overall now? Pretty much everyone here saw it and that did help because now no one wants to mess with me at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to get street cred. It did certainly keep people, it wards them off from a trying again. I'm gonna be real honest, I probably would not be as well off as I am now if it didn't happen. My family was going through tough times at that moment and I just feel like we would have had a hard time getting out of it. And I just feel like where I'm from, it's just such a bad environment. How did this experience affect your mental health? Is it something that's just like always there? I think that's a big part of it. There's physically very little that happened. 
It's just like the weird mental scarring. I've just, to be honest, I've just learned a lot of stuff about how the brain works. To actually have PTSD, I guess in my head I always picture soldiers, you know, like people yeah. fighting for their country and stuff coming away with that. And the fact that I was, you know, in my house, <laughs> you know, feels a bit lame in a way. That's <laughs> how I have PTSD, you know. I just walk away constantly f feeling all these weird emotions mainly just so thankful and in disbelief of how lucky we got. I do have PTSD and, you know, anxiety, high anxiety sometimes. And my PTSD does not prohibits me from doing things, but, you know, I'm always on edge or high alert. Just like, you know, expecting anything to happen at any moment. I don't like being grabbed or anything, you know, like friends are like all buddy, buddy, and, you know, like they hit you or push you around or something like that stuff. Affect, like, I don't like that stuff. What were the charges? that they eventually gave him. He spent six days in the ICU before he landed himself in the psych ward and then in prison after they did prove him fit to stand for trial. And then he served, I think, two years in prison. He just got paroled. He was one second away from absolutely obliterating you. And yet because he didn't, because you stood your ground and you held that weapon in a way that kept you and your fiance safe, he only got two years. That's our penal system. Not only that, but this is not his first burglary offense. He actually had a prior home invasion with an armed weapon as well. So this is a reoccurring theme for him, so to speak. He was sentenced with the accounts of my dad, my mom, my sister, and they counted the, my sister's baby because it was old enough. Uh, so he had four accounts of you know murder. So he pretty much admitted to it after the police caught him two days later. Then he took it back, said it wasn't him and that they forced him to say that it was him. I had to do a preliminary hearing a couple months right after it all happened. So I went in to testify in court and I actually had to tell my whole story right, right then actually. That was my first time publicly speaking about it. How was that being forced to, to, to speak about it and see the assailant who murdered your family attacked you, burned down your house right there in the same room as you as you recounted all of this. It was very scary and nerve wracking to have to tell it step by step actually what happened for the jury to make a sentencing. He was going to be sentenced to death. But it was like January 11th at that time. And I just remember getting so emotional and just I just started crying right then because I didn't want this guy to die either. He had a kid that I would like for his kid to be able to see him at some point in his life compared to, you know, me who never got that chance. A group of attorneys contacted me and said, we have a chance of potentially helping Mark Edwards get off death row if you're willing to help. He would have no chance of walking the streets. He would be life in prison. I said, I'd be willing to help. And everything just kind of started working out that the life in prison thing worked out. Do you hold resentment toward the intruder or have you found some part of you that forgives them? Before we continue learning about the world of surviving a home invasion. It's tough. In, in almost every aspect, this person has ruined, <laughs> it feels like he's ruined my life. I wanted to thank all of you for being the most wholesome community I have ever seen on YouTube. I feel like you guys just don't get enough appreciation for just how supportive your comments tend to be. And I feel like that is what makes the guests in this series feel so comfortable talking about such deeply personal topics in such a vulnerable way. And I really appreciate it. I'd also like to thank BetterHelp for their continued partnership. If you've been watching me for any amount of time, you know that therapy has been really instrumental in shaping who I am today by allowing me to have empathy for my younger self and therefore understand my current self better. But therapy can be customized to whatever is right for you and can be useful in providing tools to help with motivation or feelings of depression, anxiety, stress, insecurity, or whatever else you might need. BetterHelp has been continuing to improve throughout the years and screens all therapists to ensure that they have experience and that they're licensed and certified and provides customized therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone or speak over the phone if that's not something that you're comfortable with. As I'm sure many of you have found out by now, therapy can be expensive and the price of finding a therapist that you like and actually connect with 
can be daunting, which is why BetterHelp offers a more affordable alternative to in-person therapy where you can start communicating with your therapist in less than 48 hours. So thank you to BetterHelp who are giving I Spent a Day with viewers and listeners 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Padilla. That's betterhelp.com slash Padilla. Now back to the world of surviving a home invasion. Do you hold resentment toward the intruder or have you found some part of you that forgives them? It's tough. In, in almost every aspect, this person has ruined, <laughs> well, not, it feels like he's ruined my life. I don't feel anger really. I just feel it is, is something I have to deal with now. And so I really feel a lot less towards him than you might think. It just feels more of like an unfortunate event. Most people that experience something like that with one person that they can clearly pin all of their pain on, that clearly wanted to do nothing but cause harm, destroyed your family, destroyed your home, your life. I don't think most people would forgive this person. Why, why do you forgive this person? Forgiveness is a very powerful tool, but I would rather show him mercy and to show him something that he could not show me. Maybe that will save him or maybe make an impact on someone else's life. My main thing was me being a 12 year old boy, I lost my family and didn't want his son to go through what I did if his dad were to die. So I helped try to get him off a of death row and into life in prison. And so now hopefully his son can see him, maybe not be the perfect scenario, but at least he has contact with him. Many people say that owning a gun is the best or only way to defend yourself in situations like this. How true do you think that was for your situation? Great to have as a last resort, but I, I feel like you still want to do everything possible to avoid that aspect. I would say you got to prioritize getting out or hiding. Not at all true. I think you need to be fluent and capable of hand-to-hand -hand combat because I have many guns in my home, but when someone is already pointing a gun at you, you do not have any time at all, even if your gun is on your hip, to draw it. That's gonna be indication to them that you're about to cause them harm and they're gonna shoot you. My dad had a gun at that moment, but unless you have it on you at all times, you're not gonna be prepared, you know, you can have it in a lockbox, but when someone comes in your house, you're gonna, wait, let me go to the lockbox, let me get this out real quick. Right, hold on, sir. Right, yeah, and you know, it's not gonna be like that. Do you have any advice for anyone watching to better prepare them, themselves? Just don't have too much information out there. It, it's a little bit sort of a doomsday mindset, but it's, it's something to think about when you're deciding on what you think people should know about you and what you want to keep to yourself. You just never know who's out there. If anyone watching has also survived a home invasion, is there anything that you would want to say to them? To me, one of the, big, the, the biggest helps was just coming to terms with the fact that you have to relinquish control over certain things in your life. It's ne you're never going to be fully in control and you can't just worry every day. It's just a bad quality of life. Don't be afraid to ask for help. People thought I was weird for going to see a psychiatrist because there were a lot of things I didn't realize that were going on in my head until my therapist kind of explained them to me. Like, this is why you're doing this. You're trying to protect yourself. A lot of these things that we're not taught could help us relating to the way that we think or you know, defense mechanisms that we might have that, you know, walls that we put up to protect ourselves. We're not really taught to look for those things or understand them. Yeah. All right, you got five seconds to shout out or promote anything you want directly into camera. Go. Please feel free to check out my music on cashhighmusic.com. If you want to see me in a much less emotional environment, I make stuff slow for a living at the Slow Mo Guys on YouTube. I just want to thank my family and my brother David and my parents and you know, all my friends and family. I'm very thankful to Anthony Padilla for giving me a space to share my story. Make sure you subscribe below for more extremely interesting stories. Well, there you have it. I spent a day with home invasion survivors and I feel like I understand just how unpredictable these types of invasions can really be. And I commend everyone in this video for having the strength to speak about their experiences for millions of people to potentially learn from and apply to their lives. While it's absolutely important to be prepared and cautious of dangers, it's just as important to value each and every moment in our lives without the grips of fear controlling our entire psyche.
you want to find more of me, uh, the slummer guys on YouTube, it's where I make everything slow. <laughs> not, not <laughs> Sorry, just can I do it again? Let me just figure out like how good. It does feel like a, a hard <laughs> change in tone, doesn't it? A little bit. I could potentially like transition it maybe a bit better than that. <laughs>